Hey, swashbucklers, our friends, and now forget that metal swashbuckling storytelling band from Buenos Aires presents their new single, The Black Corsair. It's the opening track on their upcoming album based on the swashbuckling classic pirate novel by Emilio Salgari. Get the digital download of The Black Corsair now at underthecrossbones.com slash Corsair. Raise the sails! Swashbucklers, you're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 35. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show. Thank you very much for tuning in, spending some time with me today. I appreciate it a bunch. And listen to those golden pipes. Yes, uh, the cold is over. The voice is back. I feel so much better. Uh, it is wonderful to be able to actually speak to you again instead of y- you listening to you. <laughs> like on the last two episodes, that was not... Not my best work. Um, I apologize for that, but thank you for tuning in and uh, and staying with the show. Because uh, last week's show, uh, the last the last like last week, last couple days, huge like giant leap in downloads and listeners. And uh, I uh, I wasn't sure what was going to happen because the last couple weeks I was a little bit out of the loop uh, because I was sick. I was traveling. I was doing shows. I was trying to finish a writing project for somebody. Uh, there was a whole bunch going on, and I knew I wasn't going to have a whole bunch of time to promote the show like I normally do. So I would like to thank you for minding the store and telling your friends and putting up iTunes reviews and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we had huge growth, huge growth over the last couple of days, uh, and uh, it's been just fantastic. So thank you for doing that. Uh, uh, no, today, episode number 35 Uh, Fun fact about the number 35, it is the minimum age to run for president in the United States Uh, because 35, that's an age that we want a president. I don't know. uh, Do we want a president that hasn't yet paid off his student loans and might have a small baby in the house? Uh, Probably is just. Get it, like a lot of, I, when I think about when I was 35, the presidency pro- probably wasn't the best idea. But anyway, I think we can assume that for pretty much all the candidates, that's not a good idea either this year. But uh, well, let's not get political. We don't want to do that. My guest on the show today is author Lisa Jensen. And uh, Lisa has uh, two books that she's written, uh, The Witch from the Sea and a second one called Alias Hook. And uh, if you know anything about my penchant for the Peter Pan story, uh, you know I like to talk to anybody that's doing Peter Pan stuff. So Alias Hook is a different take on the Peter Pan story, and we're going to talk to Lisa all about that, uh, why she decided to do that story, uh, why we think that story is so um, uh, uh, what is, is permanent in our culture. It's just one of those that keeps coming back over and over again, and why that might be. We talk about Hook as a character. She's got a very different take on the whole story. It's a lot of fun. I think you're going to dig it. Uh, She's also a a film reviewer in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, And uh, despite that, we still couldn't manage to get together in person. That's coming soon. I do have an in-person interview coming up soon. Uh, But uh, in Santa Cruz... And uh, so we talk about uh, Peter Pan movies as well and and talk about some of the good ones and some of the bad ones. So I think you're going to dig this interview. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so stay tuned for that. So feeling much better. I, I did uh, in the last episode, you heard uh, not only did you hear, blah, 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 but you also heard me wondering what was going to happen with my Vancouver shows. Uh, Vancouver was great. It was super fun uh, considering it was Easter weekend and there was a giant Mexico, Canada soccer game happening in town. Uh, we had great crowds, uh, super fun. Uh, the, the the club was great, and it's a place that I'll be making a stop at uh, every year for the foreseeable future. So if you if you miss the shows in Vancouver this time, I'll be back around next year. Definitely catch them next time. Uh, after that, I came home uh, and recouped, and um, I actually spent a couple days with my girlfriend in Vancouver. It was her birthday, and uh, so we hung out and ate. Uh, Because that's what we do on vacation. We eat. And so we ate uh, Canada-y things like poutine and and uh, and um, uh, uh, the the little doughy. I can't think of what they're called. Anyway, they're they were tasty. So we ate a lot. Uh, There's all and Vancouver is very cosmopolitan. So we ate Thai food and Indian food and lots of interesting things. Uh, And then we went sightseeing. We drove around Stanley Park. We did all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we flew home. Uh, she was sick half the time, so there was no hiking and things like that. But it was good. So came home for a couple days, and then I turned around and drove to Monterey for a show uh, uh, this last Friday at a place on Cannery Row. And uh, it was uh, I like I love Monterey. It's a beautiful town. 
Uh, Cannery Row is always fun, kind of touristy, but it's always fun, you know. And uh, sometimes you get a show where, well, here's what happened. There were like 12 people in the audience at this show, and this happens every so often. Regardless, it was a super fun show. They were a great, generous, wonderful audience. And uh, sometimes you just get a small crowd for whatever reason uh, it happens. Um, Now, I'll give you, I'll let you in on a secret in the comedy industry. Every single time I walk into a venue to do a gig, they go, well, we know, you know, it may not be great crowds this weekend uh, because, you know, it's been really good, but we're not sure what's going on. And it has no, no reflection on me as the comic. It just, that's their, that's their, 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 their way of covering themselves in case there's not a good audience. So the, I hear that every single time I walk into a venue. Um, in this case, happened to be true. Uh, and Corey, the promoter, actually, he didn't even say that to me. He was hoping for the best too. But sometimes it happens. So we had 12 people, uh, five comedians. The audience was super fun. I had a really great time anyway, and that was great. The following night, I was in Madera, California, playing at a uh, winery, the Apcal Winery. And this was 180 degrees from that. Uh, not completely, but size-wise. Big outdoor stage in the middle of a vineyard. Uh, we had some, I don't know, somewhere between 800 and a thousand people in the audience, uh, outdoor gig, big sound system, the whole thing. And, uh, I was headlining the show. Uh, very fun. It's a little bit weird though, because, um, in a, in a club, you can see people, even if there's like a spotlight or whatever, you can still basically see a few rows. So I could not see hardly anybody. I could see about three people in this thing. It's dark. Uh, I've got spotlights in my eyes and, um, I could almost see nothing. And and outdoors, the sound just kind of goes nowhere, right? Uh, all the laughter goes straight up. And so I had to, like, really uh, be present, really pay attention to the timing of my jokes. So as I so I wasn't stepping on laughs or letting them go too long or any of that kind of stuff, all that comedy timing stuff. And so I was really having to, like, pay attention and kind of navigate. And then the the vineyard is next to a train track and a freeway. Right. So the freeway, not a big deal. The laughs are covering the car noise. That's great. But trains keep rolling through. So now I can't now I can barely hear the audience because the laughter goes straight up and I've got freight trains rolling off to my left. And now I can't hear anything. So it was almost like doing comedy blind uh, and and it, like in a in a sensory deprivation tank that was super noisy. <laughs> So it was an adventure. It was a fun show. We had a great time. It's always nice playing for a crowd that big. And uh, and if you came out, thank you for coming out. It was super good. Uh, lots more shows uh, coming up this month. Uh, April the 8th, I will be at the Sports Basement in San Francisco, California. That is part of a comedy crawl happening in San Francisco that night. Uh, April the 9th, I'll be headlining a show at JJ's Blues in San Jose, California. That's right here in my hometown. Hardly ever play my hometown. Um, so if you are in San Jose, come and ca- I don't think I've played San Jose in over a year. So that's going to be fun. JJ's is a great room. April the 15th, I will be at the New Bohemia in Santa Cruz, California. That's where our guest today, Lisa Jensen, is from Santa Cruz. So uh, April the 15th at the New Bohemia in Santa Cruz. April the 16th, I will be at uh, a show called The Setup. At uh, That's at 222 Hyde in San Francisco, California. And then April the 29th, I will be at the Washington Inn in Oakland, California. Yep, staying close to home this month because uh, I got to... I got to finish some projects and do some things and do some writing. So I'm going to be working out a ton of new material this month at a bunch of these shows. So come out and see the stuff that'll be in my next special. If you want to find out all the tour dates, you can go to underthecrossbones.com and click on the tour dates button. Uh, We're updating them as we speak. My assistant is in the midst of doing that. Uh, Let's see. uh, Hey, you know what? I got to tell you this. I'm super excited. uh, And you may not you may not care about this uh, at all, but. Guns N' Roses has announced a ton of tour dates for their reunion tour. And I have to tell you, I, their first album came out at a very, uh, one of those seminal times in the childhood, in the teenage years. I think I was, I think I was uh, 16, right? Uh, Appetite for Destruction came out. To this day, still, it's an album that I never get tired of listening to. It's still in regular rotation. So I was very excited uh, to to hear that they were going to actually tour with this reunion thing. And so I got my tickets uh, just today to go see them in San Francisco in August. And I'm super excited about that. Um, I've I've uh, had the opportunity. I hung out with Slash one night after a show. He's a super nice guy. Uh, we opened for, and my band opened for Gilby Clark years ago, right after he got kicked out of Guns N' Roses. And he's a super nice guy. Um Gilby's not in the reunion, which I'm I'm very disappointed about. They've got they've got another guy who I'm not uh, familiar with. He's whoever the new guy is. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, and so the guys that I've met from Guns N' Roses are fantastic people. I've never had a run in with Axel, so I can't give you any any news there. But the guys that I've met are fantastic, and I love their music, uh, especially the first couple albums. And I'm super super excited to get to go see them in August. So if you're going uh, to any of the shows on the tour, you know uh, uh, you can you can talk to me about that, and we can we can nerd out together on Guns N' Roses stuff. Uh, and that'll be cool. Also, finally, I uh, since I've been traveling and all this kind of stuff, I haven't had a chance to see any movies, and we finally got a chance to go see Zootopia yesterday. Um, because uh, Disney nerd right here, yeah, that's me. Uh huh. I've been excited for it. Uh, because I like uh, I like Robin Hood and I like the anthropomorphic animal Disney films. Those are great, and so I was excited to see this one, and it totally holds up. Really great film. I think it's a little. Maybe a little too on the nose with the race discussion thing, but it fits the plot. It works. It's great. Um, I may be the only person that gets both the Emmett Otter and the Breaking Bad references uh, in the film. If you haven't seen it yet, watch out for those. Um, There's lots of cool little references and stuff. Uh, and if you've never seen Emma Daughter's Jug Band Christmas, go find a DVD copy of it and uh, and you'll get that reference too. everybody will get the Breaking Bad reference and they kind of hammer it home anyway. But yes, if you haven't seen Zootopia, that's a great movie. Go see it. I uh, have not seen Batman versus Superman yet. Uh, my girlfriend's dying to because she loves the superhero movies. But the reviews have been um, questionable. Shall we say? Yeah. All right. So I'm not super looking forward to that one, but uh, there it is. All right. So let's get into the interview, shall we? Uh, This is my interview with author Lisa Jensen. Check it out. You are an author and a a movie critic and all sorts of stuff, but I specifically want to talk about the the two books that you have out that pertain to this show, uh, which are Alias Hook and The Witch from the Sea. So let's, let's talk about Witch from the Sea first. Tell me a little bit about what that one's about. Uh, well, it was my first novel, and it was uh, a story I'd wanted to write for a long time, and it's about a young woman who runs away from the, the stifling gentility of Boston, of a girls' boarding school, and runs away to sea, and the ship that she stows away on is captured by pirates, and uh, the pirates, the notorious pirates of Cuba. So the time frame is about 1823, and so she's, she's on board this ship, and she kind of runs away from... Uh, from the stifling life that a young girl is expected of a young girl uh, for the free life on the open sea, which was always a theme that really resonated with me. I just thought it was really cool. Um, so I wrote this book, and uh, I, just, I had it actually published first in German, a German language edition, oh, wow. which was a big surprise to all of us, and me <laughs> and my agent and everybody, you know. And so it came out a beautiful cover, beautiful, beautiful artwork on the cover and everything in a language that I couldn't read. <laughs> you know, so. But it looked impressive. You know? It was just so they could uh, hide typos. I guess, yeah, who would know? You know? <laughs> so that was, and then it came out, two years later it came out in a, in a paperback version, which is another beautiful cover. But in the, in the meantime, my agent, my agent at the time was not able to sell it um, in, in English, oh. to either in England or, uh, or America. Uh, so that was depressing. So I finally took it back, and um, I, I found a, a little tiny publisher who had published another pirate book, and she loved it, so she published it in, the, in this country. That's fantastic. And uh, 1823 is sort of an interesting uh, choice for a time period for a pirate novel, since that's almost well over 100 years over the, uh, the, the Golden Age, as we'd call the it. Golden what, Age. Yeah. What made yeah. you t- choose that time period in particular? It was just, it was kind of, I didn't really, at that, you know, I didn't really know that much, except for all the movies I watched all my life with my uh-huh. mom, who, all these, you know, Errol Flynn movies and stuff. Um, I didn't really know the period of the Golden Age that well. Okay. But, you know, kind of the you know, the early 18, um, 1800s, I kind of, the early 19th century, I sort of was more familiar with that, you know, period having read more of it and stuff. And I was, at the time, I would say, well, I didn't really want, you know, pirates stomping around in big boots and, and you know, all these 18th, I mean, you know, 17th century coats and all this stuff, uh-huh. lacy cuffs and all that stuff, which, of course, exactly what I wrote about in Alias <laughs> later on. But at the time, I thought, no, let's stick to something a little bit more, you know, more contemporary, relatively speaking. So uh, I just chose that period. And also, it was, a, it was a very, you know, time of ferment in the in the Caribbean, uh-huh. or the West Indies, as it was actually called in those days. Sure, yeah. Uh, 
they they just you know it was everybody you know the war of 1812 was just over and and everybody the the sea was full of ships and all these navies that had been the Amer- the US navy that had been formed for the for the war of 1812 all these sailors were out roaming around with nothing to do there was no war to fight they had, so everybody was going to the indies to make their fortunes and you know the sugar islands of spain were and you know were very popular uh, places for people to come and the plantations and the, you know all that stuff so it just was a lot going on in that time period uh, that you know made piracy kind of attractive. So yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's yeah. an interesting way of thinking about it. And <laughs> what was your? Uh, so you said it was a story that you'd been thinking about for a long time. How how far back did it uh, date? Uh, that I wanted to write this. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just I wanted to write a pirate novel forever. Mm. <laughs> I mean, okay. and I said I chalk it up to watching too many old Errol Flynn movies on TV with my mom, <laughs> who was a big fan. Uh, I just I remember I I was in an after I was you know when I was in high school, I was in an after school film club or something, and somebody bought you know they had a projector and a sixty millimeter film one day after school, and they showed Captain Blood. Oh yeah, <laughs> with uh, with Errol Flynn, I'm going ah you know so that was that's I, I discovered later on that was unusual in pirate lore in that you know he was he was subjugated and he had to join the slave ship and and then they all he took over the slave ship and then they became pirates and then later on after he you know cut his swath and everything was you know, the the um the institutions that he was fighting against were subdued he was he had to give up piracy and go back and and be like a you know a, a, a good person again but i thought you know wouldn't it be more fun if he got to stay a pirate <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, so many pirates, they just have to give up piracy at the end if they still want to be the hero, you know, so. Right. Uh, anyway, so that influenced me. Yeah. <laughs> thought, and, let's make the pirates the good guys. You know? and, and it's funny how much that was Hollywood at work because most of them didn't, didn't, didn't get a chance to become the good guy again. They just were hung. And, yeah, right. That, <laughs> was, that was the end of that. <laughs> Based on real life. So, so um, from yeah. there, was your path always as a writer? Is that what you always wanted to do? How did you get into writing? I got into writing, I don't know, I just, it was just something I, I wrote stories as a kid. I mean, who doesn't do all that stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, I I uh, went to, I took four years at University of California, you know, and I was, ended up in Santa Cruz because of that. And then I graduated in some very strange major, because it was the 70s, and they made up all sorts of things, you know? So, um, but I, I thought, well, okay, I've graduated, I have a BA, now what? Yeah. <laughs> So um, I have had, I was going to be an English lit major, but I found out that they had to do orals. We had oh. to do an oral exam where you have to speak and defend your position. And I thought, uh-huh. mm, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I, did, I had to do something. So I went to work in a movie theater because I had to get a job right away because I had to pay my rent. Um, and and uh, after about six months or something, there was a little weekly paper in town, and the per- person who was the film critic said, oh, there's too many screens in town for just one person to cover this beat, you know. Mm-hmm. Anybody else out there feels like they'd like to do this, too? Let me know. So I, you know, had just seen some dreadful thing at the, at the drive-in, so I wrote, like, type, typed up a one-page review and sent it in, and two weeks later, he called me up and said, oh, you know, seven people responded to that thing in the paper, and you're the only one who sent me something written. Ah. Oh. So I thought, ooh. <laughs> Haze to be prepared. So I <laughs> yeah, you know, that that, that, was, I, that that seemed logical to me, but who knows? I guess everybody else has said, hey, I want to go to the movies for free. You know? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, who wouldn't, you know? But uh, so then he, after a year, he left town, and uh, I just inherited the job. So I've been a film critic for a long, long time in Santa Cruz, and I've seen a lot of movies, and I've watched a lot of plots play out. I didn't see nearly enough pirate movies, because they don't make enough anymore. Right. Uh, and I just had this idea in my brain that it wouldn't be fun to write a pirate novel. So That's great. And that's yeah. the good times that you write for, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. that's a a great little weekly zine. I, I like that one. It I, is, and it's been around for a long time. So. A long time. I yeah. think I've been in there myself once or twice. So really? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm I'm in San Jose. I'm not far from you, so I I play yes. Santa Cruz okay. quite a lot. Um, yeah. Good. Great. So let's talk about then uh, Alias Hook, which is your newer book. Tell me about that one. Um, this again comes. Um, I'm I'm again in my youth. <laughs> My misspent youth. Uh, I was a, you know, the Peter Pan story. I always liked the Peter Pan story, but I never really liked Peter Pan as uh-huh. a character, you know, because when I was a little kid, he was just like he was so full of himself, and he was such a brat, and he was just like all the little boys I went to school with. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> was anything fun about that? I guess, like traditionally, I guess little girls are supposed to like want, you know, they're they're in love with Peter, and then Captain Hook is a villain. But I always liked Captain Hook much better. Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, he was funnier, he had better lines, he made jokes that nobody else understood because he was surrounded by these little boys. 
So I just had, that, that had always been in the back of my mind that, you know, the, what I liked about Peter Pan was the pirates. And I loved Captain Hook especially. And then it was, again, movie-oriented. Uh, there was a movie that came out a few years ago, a Peter Pan movie. It was live action. Uh-huh. And uh, as opposed to like a cartoon or something, and the character I was I was writing my review of it the next the next day, and uh, the the character that I was writing about the character that I mean the actor that played Hook I said, you know he, he makes you he makes you feel the the pathos of a or the tragedy of a of an adult trapped in a world run by eleven year old boys. Oh, it does sound and, hellish, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's my vision of hell right there. And literally, a little light, little light bulb went off. You know, a little arc light bulb went off over my head, uh-huh. bing, you know. And uh, I kind of closed that document, opened up another document, and I wrote what became the first paragraph of the book, just looking at the Neverland from Captain Hook's point of view and how maybe it's not such a great place. It may be a great place for fantasy for little kids, but not so much for him. So that was where I got the idea, and that voice literally just kept talking to me. And I just, every chance I got, I would just write another couple paragraphs and he'd look around and he'd tell me how he thought of the fairies and the Indians and, of course, the boys. You know. uh-huh. uh, and that just, it just came like, I mean, I didn't really plan out the, the plot or anything. It's just, I just kept hearing him talking to me. And that's how I uh, came up with that. That's interesting. What is it, because uh, I'm a huge Captain Hook fan myself. I have Captain Hook stuff all over my office here, and oh, great. Uh, which is part of why I wanted to talk to you about your book. And what do you think okay. is it about both that story in general and about Captain Hook in particular that it makes it such enduring stories and characters to still be around this long past? I guess I guess traditionally, again, it's the the charm of kids don't want to have to grow up. I mean, and that's that. I guess when you're a child, that's supposed to be the most charming thing about it. And then, but you know, from the viewpoint of adults looking back, oh, wouldn't it be fabulous to be a child forever? Maybe not. (laughs) Uh I don't think that would be a great. You know, I mean, when you look at it from. I looked at it from my adult perspective. I didn't think it was that great. But, of course, I hadn't been crazy about the fantasy uh, to begin with, even as a child. So I don't know why it endures, but I guess that that tension between childhood and adulthood always sort of in limbo going on forever and the, you know, the, the back and forth between having to grow up or you know, being forced to grow up and maybe staying a child or maybe you can beat the odds and stay a child forever. I mean, there's something about the dynamic between those two things, I think, that make it enduring that's true yeah and i think um uh being certainly in santa cruz there's a lot of people that are living in that limbo between oh, yeah. childhood and adulthood yeah i came to the right place <laughs> <laughs> one of the things i always liked about the character is that he was a flawed villain he was not this super uh perfect always his plan always was well thought out and that kind of stuff that that he had these sort of he had fears he had um uh, uh, phobias and misconceptions and he made mistakes and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that always that is what appealed to me as, as even over a lot of the other Disney villains. Um, yeah. You know, when you look at somebody like uh, Maleficent or even like mm-hmm. Cruella DeVille or somebody like that, where you go, uh, they're a little, they're, they're perfectly evil. Whereas yes. Captain Hook was not perfectly evil. Uh, he would also freak out over the crocodile and things like that. Right. Right. And, right. And t- to me that made him a much more human type of villain. Yeah, and I thought too. And again, like I said, he was he was also funnier. He always had the funniest lines, and that's yeah. what appealed to me as a as a character. And I just started, you know, thinking, why is this guy the bad guy? What ha-? and that that where the book came from too. I was like, why is he the villain? How do, how come he gets chosen to be this designated villain and have to, you know, be the bad guy in this island full of like obnoxious children? So, <laughs> uh, that I thought I thought that was a lot of pathos there. Yes, <laughs> that, that could be dealt with. So my 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 James Hook is very flawed too. But um, he probably doesn't deserve how he ended up. And the whole point of my book is like, well, what could I do with the character now? Well, I'd start at where the original Peter Pan ended, which is when he supposedly falls into the mouth of the crocodile and is taken away. I thought, okay, so what if that doesn't happen? What if he doesn't die? What if he can't die? What if he's cursed to spend forever in in the Neverland playing villain to these little boys? Uh So that's where I came out. So so my main plot point was, what if he got one last chance to get out? So that was uh, getting him out of the Neverland was my my impetus for writing this whole book. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I felt like he'd been there long enough. <laughs> a mercy mission, and yeah. uh, so there's a there's a Wendy involved too, is there not? Well, there is a woman. Uh-huh. There is a a a grown woman who, imp- against all odds, improbably and against all the Pan's rules, 
dreams her way to the Neverland because mm. people only get to the Neverland by dreaming. Right. It's the dreaming place. It's the place where children have their dreams. Uh, and she, an adult woman, is absolutely verboten to, to the little boys who, you know, uh, they, don't, they don't want anybody telling them what to do. They don't want to, you know, they, even though they, in, traditionally in the, in the Barry version, they go get, he goes and gets a Wendy and, and she becomes their mother for a right. while. In, in the real life, these boys don't really want an adult around unless they can fight him like Hook, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> somebody that they can, they can play with, you know. So they, uh, this, but this woman uh, improbably comes back and that's when Hook realizes that maybe the boy's magic is not, in you know impenetrable. If this woman can come back to the can come to the island, you know against the 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 boy's wishes, maybe there's some way for him to get out. So interesting. And she has a reason for being there, but I'm not going to give away exactly what that is. Yeah, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to read the book. Yes, I yeah. still I still have <laughs> to read you. the book. Yeah, no, I still have to read the book because we actually just we just made contact like a week ago, and I haven't had a chance yes. to grab it yet because uh, it's a. An entirely packed month for me, but uh, yeah, well, that's I'm great. Sure. Well, if you're a Captain Hook book I, I'm a fan, I hope you you will like this book. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure I will. I definitely will. And it's interesting that I've seen a lot of the the um, the the pan rewrites and and done you know new stories like your own done by other author, authors and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. They all tend to come back to Wendy as a character too, and yeah. who I always thought was a little bit of a bland character. Um, in in the original story, yeah. but I guess making <laughs> making her an adult lends a whole new uh, set of problems and uh, controversies well, to it. Yeah, the thing in my book is it's not the Wendy; she's not that Wendy. The it's character a Wendy. Comes back. Yeah. Her name is Stella. But um, that in my concept, I thought would it be interesting since Hook has been there so long? What if there? What if there's a whole? There's been a whole history of Wendy's, uh-huh. like plural Wendy's. So like every now and then he goes back and gets you know, a, a, a girl has to play mother and tell the boys stories and mend their tights or whatever they do, you know. Uh-huh. And, and, but it's only one at a time. And, and then, uh, like the Wendy's, just like the Lost Boys, uh-huh. all the various generations of Lost Boys, when they grow up, when they start to grow up, when they threaten to grow up, when Pan perceives that they're getting you know, beyond him, he has to send them back to the world because you can't be a grown-up in the Neverland. Unless you're Captain Hook and you're and you're stuck there forever, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so there's been there have been multiple Wendy's in the past when my book starts. I like that. Uh, it, yeah, it becomes I, sort of the archetype of a Wendy then. Yes, yes, yeah. So that so that so I so it's just not like in my book. There's not this the Wendy. There's uh-huh. the, the famous Wendy. Um, but that can be. I mean, a lot of the people that I mean, a lot of the the readers who love Peter Pan, Wendy's their favorite character, or Tiger Lily is their favorite character. And there's mm. like, there's no Tiger Lily in my book at all. Uh-huh. There's a, a potential Wendy, and but it's very, it's not the Wendy that people think of. So right. Oh, that's interesting. I try to have some fun with the story and do some different stuff with it. That's cool. I I find that more people rewrite the Pan story than than almost any of the other old stories i mean even a hundred years ago or or even the fairy tales like you don't see a lot of uh you know sleeping beauty rewrites and things like that and, and i don't know maybe the people who keep putting zombies in movies will do that but yeah well, um, yeah lately they all have zombies in them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i think it's interesting that it's that particular story that people keep going back to to play with new angles on mm-hmm. and uh well yeah late, lately there's been a lot of there's a whole category just in the last I don't know, five years or something of fairy tale retellings. Right. So now there are starting to be more Sleeping Beauties and more Cinderella's and more all this stuff, you know. Um, so there's, but those are like the classic fairy tales. And then there's people working out on, you know, like Peter Pan is not a fairy tale. And, you know, it's, it's sure. and like the Wizard, the Wizard of Oz is not a fairy tale. They're not from Grimm. They're yeah. not from the ancient legend. You know, they're just more, more modern takes working on the, in the kind of, children's fantasy realm uh-huh. there's been a lot of um oz books too you know, wick, you know oh, that's true yeah very green right wicked and then a lot of sort of wicked you know in the in the wake of wicked you know, yeah. books coming out so um yeah so that is kind of becoming a more of a subgenre right now but boy if i had known how many peter pan you know versions there were out there i probably would never i've been too intimidated to even start <laughs> my book you know? so, sometimes so it's best not to know up, yeah yeah, sorry. Right. If you're thinking about working out a, a, a fairy tale or something, just go ahead and write the book first, and don't find out about it. You know, don't yeah. find out what else is out there first, because you'll just be too uh, too freaked out. <laughs> and do you think you'll be doing any sequels to it or anything like that? 
I my my editor was uh, at at Thomas Dunn Books was interested in a sequel, and I I started working on that and in the in the I I that it's it's a possibility. I've I've worked on a I I've, I've not not to take the characters that are in Alias Hook and take them back to the Neverland because uh-huh. I think I've, they've been through enough. You know, <laughs> but, but I was thinking I have a, a sequel in mind that might take me back to the Neverland from a different viewpoint, but okay. um, it's not set in stone yet. So. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, we'll yeah. we'll look forward to that whenever that yeah. happens. And so, I, I I feel I should ask you as a movie critic, which is your favorite Peter Pan movie aside from the obvious choices? Yeah, uh, let's see. My favorite Peter Pan movie. Well, actually, I was a big fan of the Disney version just because, uh-huh. again, you know, it was I believe Han, Hans Conried did the voice of, of yes. Captain Hook, so I thought, yes. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, I I I don't know my I don't know if I was favorite. Well, you know, the one that I was I was watching when I got the idea for the book, the one that came out in. 2004 maybe it was like okay. the live action mm-hmm. uh that was that was actually pretty well done so um and it had uh jason isaacs as as, as uh captain hook and he was quite good right um so that was pretty good um i can tell you a book i a book i can tell you a movie i thought was horrible which is the recent pan that came out last uh oh. last year yeah, oh my it, gosh. I couldn't even watch it. As soon as I saw that they were using Nirvana and the Ramones in the soundtrack, I, I was like, I oh, that seems like such a bad choice to make. <laughs> I know. I had been sort of looking, provisionally looking forward to it because my book was out by then. I thought, okay, it doesn't matter. I, 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 I adulterated this character as I, as I saw fit. Anybody else can do it. I'm good uh-huh. with that, you know. And I, I know, okay, it'll be in. Maybe it'll be kind of fun because it'll make Captain Hook, Peter Pan interesting again. Maybe I'll sell some book, you know. But I went the first time I saw a trailer for it. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I just after a while, I just thought, you know, when it finally came out, I thought everybody's going to ask me what I think about this movie. Yeah, I'm just going to have to suck it up and go. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I was not, you know, I was, but I was stunned at how bad it was. <laughs> It was so elaborate. Even even Hugh Jackman running around in black leather did not save it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, that's saying a lot, you know. So, oh gosh. Anyway, yeah. And also, was... the hook character was blonde and American. So, right there. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, that's yeah. So many bad choices in that movie. Yeah. So I, that was that was pretty awful. I didn't even get past the trailers. Honestly, I, I could. I was like, I can't. I'm not going to pay to no, see this I, movie. I yeah. believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, but you know what? In the end, they paid me to go. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I probably I had to gone. go say something about it. If, if had somebody paid me, I might have gone and yeah. wasted ninety minutes <laughs> or on it. Maybe not. You know. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, yeah, don't put it on your Netflix queue. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny because that's what I do with the movies where I go, nah, I don't really want to see that. But I kind of feel like it's almost like uh, like I feel like I should put myself through that just as a, a fan of the story in general. <laughs> like, I right. Should, yeah, no, I, should I know. know. And that's, yeah. You have to weigh those things, you know, yeah. OK. And I, you know, I should probably see every version of this, but, you know. But, uh, I can I can tell you you can skip that one. <laughs> no, okay, I may, I probably will then. And so, uh, what is because uh, because you have been reviewing movies for so long? What is your view of like the the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and things like that? Um, again, a big par- pirate fan, you know, I am, and of course, I was like the ride, you know, too. Because uh-huh. I saw your website, you like the ride too. Sure, oh yeah, <laughs> you grew up on that ride like I did, so yep. that was fun. Um, but I I went to the first movie. I thought it was not as serious as it could have been it didn't mm. have to be really serious but i loved johnny depp i loved the character he created which uh-huh. was not in the script i mean that was him riffing on this whole idea sure know? and now it's become pirate lore you know he was based it on keith richards you know he did tell uh-huh. the pirates were the rock star you know that's and that was good and i thought that was great and i've always i w- i always have loved him in the movies but the movies have just gotten sillier and sillier <laughs> <laughs> But they make so much money you know, yeah. that they just keep keep going back and, and doing more of them, you know. So Yeah, it'll um, be interesting was, to see what happens with the fifth one here because the fourth one was kind of a disaster. Yeah, they, well, that was, you know, and I, I, I don't know if you've read the original On Stranger Tides by Tim Powers. It was a great, great fantasy writer. Had nothing to do with the, because they did Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, colon On Stranger Tides or something. Right. It had, they had Blackbird as a character. Uh-huh. That was about the only point of <laughs> connection between the two of them. Um, but On Stranger Tides is a great book. It's a it's a it's a great pirate book. It's got the fantasy element, but um, but it's uh, it's it's really excellent. I'm a big fan of that book, so I was dis- way ex- extra disappointed <laughs> that. Pirates of the Caribbean didn't really do right by it, you know. Oh, uh, interesting. Um, I have not read that book, and I should. Yeah. 
Oh, it's good. Yeah, and it, it goes pretty fast. And I just, you know, I read it again just before the movie came out. Just, you know, and of course, just in case there was any connection at all between the movie and the plot, and there actually wasn't. So was <laughs> <laughs> I could have saved myself the time, but but actually, I enjoyed write, reading again, so that's okay. But um, yeah, there you go. I, yeah, and so I, I I wish I wish they were better. I wish they were not so silly, uh-huh. you know. <laughs> And I thought, you know, what's you know, the fact that all the characters are always fighting each other, and they're always, you know, who's they're always suspicious of each other. You know, whatever happened to good old fashioned getting banding together and yo ho hoing and you know <laughs> us against them? You know, it's not like that at all. It's kind of silly. So I yeah, know. yeah, they are. Well, it's definitely a Disney take on the pirate yeah. thing. It's it's yeah. uh, certainly different. It's, uh, you know, I wouldn't expect Disney to come out with black sails or something like that, you know, where it's yeah. uh, super over the top serious and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, see, I haven't seen black. I would love to see black sails, but I didn't, um, I don't, I don't get stars. So. Oh yeah. You have to Whichever get, candle is on, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't either, but my parents do. And so I use their oh, password well, and watch it on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, hey, <laughs> that works. <laughs> it works nicely. So what, uh, what is the next project for you? What are you working on? Well, I just literally last week sent my own, um, my le- my next manuscript in it's, it's, it's to a different publisher. It's in, it's Candlewick, and it's actually it's a take on Beauty and the Beast. And I didn't oh, okay. really plan to fairy tale retelling for the rest of my life, but um, it was again a sort of an idea that I had. It was marinating for a while on the back burner um, about uh, how the Beast character. You know, the whole point of Beauty and the Beast is, you know, she she falls in love with him, and then he turns back into the prince. But the handsome prince at the end, he's paid his dues. But I always thought, what if there was somebody who was not beauty, who was in love with the beast uh-huh. and didn't want him to turn back into the prince? Maybe there was a reason he was turned into beast. Anyway, so I came up with this whole plot, like, what if we could make beast? Maybe he could become the hero in his own story and not be the, you know, be the one who has to be sacrificed at the end of the story. Oh, okay. I mean, it's the moment that all thinking women dread is when the beast, <laughs> the fabulous beast, turns back into this prince. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> 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 You're just not the beast I thought I knew. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, you beast! Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that's my that's coming out actually at the in the spring of 2017. That comes okay. out. So. Great. And do you have a title for it yet? Uh, well, my title was Beast: A Love Story. Not sure if they're going to keep that. My okay. editor said she loved the title, but she wasn't sure if they if you know if the people in marketing who actually run publishing uh-huh. <laughs> would go for that title or not. Oh, but maybe they will. Who knows? Great. So, uh, well, we'll be watching yeah. for that. So where, yeah. where is the best people, best place online for people to keep track of what you're doing? Um, I have a Facebook page, Lisa Jensen books on my Facebook page. I have, okay. I have a, a website, which is uh, Lisa Jensen online express, uh, uh, which is a blog spot site, which is where I blog about various things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Blather cool. on about new projects and stuff. So those are the two best places to start. Great. Everybody needs a place online to blather, so that's fine. There you go. <laughs> Good. Well, I will make sure that all that is linked up on the show notes. And uh, this has been fun. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want everybody to know about? Uh, <laughs> What a <laughs> what a platform! No, actually, I think we covered all the bases, so that's good. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been fun, Lisa. I'm glad we we got a chance to talk after our uh, our snafu yesterday with my laptop being there, a disaster. I, I know yes. technical difficulties. <laughs> that's right. Well, no, it's been really really fun, Phil. Thank you so much. Good. I'm glad. Well, I hope we can talk again soon. Okay. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with author Lisa Jensen. I will have uh, links to both of her books on the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 035. Uh, and you can get the links to Witch from the Sea and Alias Hook there. You can also uh, find out more about Lisa at her website, uh, which is http colon slash slash, right? That part, ljo-express.blogspot.com. If you're driving and you can't remember all that, just come to the show notes under the crossbones.com slash 035, and there will be a link there for all that. I uh, appreciate you listening to the show. If you want to help support the show, that is super helpful. You can go to the support page under the uh, under the crossbones.com slash support, and there there's a little PayPal button if you want to just donate some money. That's awesome. We can do it public radio style. That's cool. There's an Amazon banner. If you click on that Amazon banner and you buy yourself something nice, I get a little kickback on that. Doesn't cost you anything more. Totally free on your end except for whatever you're buying, and I get a little commission. That's nice for you and nice for me. And you can be a sponsor of the show, like our sponsors this week. Now, for again, you can uh, sponsor the show. It's very cheap, uh, and uh, you can get all that information 
on the uh, support page as well. That's under the crossbones.com slash support. Check it out. And uh, LifeLock, LifeLock, there are pirates out there. I don't want you to get your identity stolen. It's tax time. Uh, it, it, people actually get their stuff stolen, uh, their information stolen from like tax returns and things like that in the mail. Just in my neighborhood, there's been uh, reports of people stealing mail lately, and I live in a really nice neighborhood. So it doesn't make any, it can happen anywhere is what I'm saying, friends. So I want you to get some identity protection. It's just part of the cost of doing business these days. And LifeLock is the way to go uh, because not only do they search all the deep, dark parts of the web to find your information and, or make sure that it's not out there. If they do find it, they're going to help you fix it. And that's the that's the best part. That's the part you don't get with the free credit or monitoring thingies and whatever. Um, and and it's cheap. It's less than nine bucks a month. It's I'm, I have it. It's awesome. They've been very helpful. Uh, so uh, you can get 10 percent off. Your membership, just go to underthecrossbones.com slash lifelock and click on the start your membership button and you will get 10% off of your lifelock membership. That's all good. Uh, make sure to get the ebook that I've got for you, The Pirates of Panama or The Buccaneers of America, whichever whichever title you prefer, by Alexander Exquemelin. It's free. It's a seminal piece of bookery. Bookery? I don't even know if that's a word. It's a word now. It's a seminal piece of bookery <laughs> in pirate knowledge. You need it. All right? It's if you haven't read it and you like pirates, this is just a book you got to read and you can get it for free. Uh, you can go to under the crossbones.com, click on the ebook button and you'll get it. Or if you're out and about and you just got your phone or whatever, text the word pirate and your email address to nine, four, two, five, three, text the word pirate and your email address to nine, four, two, five, three. That'll kick you back a little link to download the ebook for free. It's cool. You're going to dig it. All right. We got some comedy and music on the show today. Uh, we have comedy and, and we're going to we're going to nerd out a little bit today. We're going to nerd out. There's kind of a connection that I got worked out here. All right. So uh, f- comedy today from Johnny Osborne. And uh, Johnny is one of the guys that opened up for me at the Madeira Winery the other night, the Apcal Winery. Super funny. Uh, and this is one of my favorite bits of his. So I think you're going to really enjoy it. It's a it's a if yeah, shut up. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you about it. I'll just let you listen to it. And then um. And you'll figure out the connection later. After that, we're going to hear a song called Chasing Bats by a band called Smashy Claw. Uh, They're a group from Denver. Uh, They they, uh, lean in the funny direction a little bit, but they're very experimental. Uh, Cool stuff. The the song, uh, I have to tell you what the song is about because it's not super obvious from the song. But the song is about a famous Batman comic called The Killing Joke. Uh, And The Killing Joke is right now being turned into an animated film uh, with uh, Mark Hamill voicing the Joker. So it's a very famous, if you're into comics at all, you know what the killing joke is. Uh, if you're not into comics uh, and you don't know what the killing joke is, uh, that's probably one that's worth reading if you want to see what a really good comic is all about. So let's dig in. We're going to hear some comedy from Johnny Osborne and then a song called Chasing Bats by Smashy Claw. We, what we did is like we got poor man's cable now, okay? And so... I got like 40 channels, okay? And HBO was running free HBO all weekend long, one weekend. And I was so excited. And so what, I am white trash and everything. So I unplugged my cable box on Friday, and then I plugged it back in on Monday. And what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to get all the channels for free for like six months without the cable company knowing. And that did not go to point plan at all. True story. I got HBO in Spanish. Espanol. Have you guys ever seen Empire Strikes Back? Yeah. Have you ever seen it in Spanish? It's hilarious. It's Lucas. Vamos. Ha, 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 ha. 
that's our show for today friends thank you again for listening in if you want to get all the show notes you can go to under the crossbones.com slash zero three five make sure to go check out my guests you can find lisa jensen at ljo-express.blogspot.com you can find johnny osborne at facebook.com slash johnny comedy johnny spelled regular you know and you can find smashy claw at smashyclaw.com all good keep leaving those itunes reviews they really really help a lot to bring new people in i appreciate seeing the nice comments as well all the show notes under the crossbones.com slash zero three five if you want to hear about any more about my music my comedy my uh tour dates uh the books i'm writing any of that kind of stuff you can go to phil johnson until next week i'll see you then